It is Palm Sunday. We're approaching the end of the public ministry of Jesus Christ. He is about to make what people have called his triumphal entry into the city of Jerusalem. Many of us have heard this story since we're young. Many of us have a picture that's etched into our minds of the large crowds of people lining the road, waving palm branches, shouting out praises to him. Jesus knew this day would come. He'd been telling his disciples for a long time that it would come. Matthew 16, 21, he said to them, I must go to Jerusalem. And there, he said, I must suffer many things from the elders, from the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed, and on the third day, be raised. But that was ten months ago. Jesus and his disciples have been back to Jerusalem twice since he made that statement to them. And a lot of things have happened since he made that statement. Incredible things. His disciples have seen him heal the blind, the deaf, the lame. They've seen him heal crippled people, people who were crippled from birth, people who were demon-possessed. He healed thousands of people. The disciples listened to him preach and teach the people. He taught them, not with his own words. He taught them with the words from above. He taught them with the words of God the Father. And everyone who heard him agreed. No man has ever spoken the way this man speaks. When the Jewish leaders sent their experts from Jerusalem to try to trick him, to try to argue with him about their law, he silenced all of them with his wisdom. His disciples saw him feed thousands with just a few fish, some loaves of bread. They witnessed as he walked on the sea, he walked through a raging storm, and then with a word, he calmed the winds and the waves. They were there when he said a prayer and he gave a command and the dead came back to life. A lot has happened. A lot has happened along the way. But now Jesus has said he's going to go to Jerusalem for the last time. He's going to make the triumphal entry. But you know, after all the things that have happened, the disciples still didn't understand. Luke 18, 31 through 33, Jesus took the disciples aside again. And he said to them again, Behold, I am going up to Jerusalem. And all things that have been spoken about the Son of Man will be accomplished. He will be delivered up to the Gentiles. He will be mocked. He will be mistreated. He will be spit upon. And after they have scourged him, they will kill him. And on the third day, he will rise. He told them what would happen when they went to Jerusalem. During that same time, he spoke to them again, not only telling them what would happen, he told them again why he had come to earth in the first place. Matthew 20, verse 28, he reminded them. He said, I have come to give my life as a ransom for many. He said, I haven't come to be a martyr. That's not why I want to go to Jerusalem. He said, I have not come just to be an example of how to live. Though he is. He is an example. He said, I haven't come to overthrow the Romans and to free the people from their rule. None of those things. He reminds his disciples for his purpose. He says, I have come to be a ransom. A lutron in Greek. A release. The price that was paid to release a slave. The price that was paid to release a prisoner. He says, I have come to exchange my life for your freedom. He says, I have come to be bound as a sacrifice so you can be unbound from sin. Matthew 28, he reminds the disciples 
That is why he has come into the world. That is why he must go to Jerusalem, and that is why he must die. For 30 years, he lived in an obscure village as the son of a a Jewish carpenter. For three years, he traveled around the area, village to village, town to town, ministering, bringing the message from God, bringing the message that he alone, the Son of Man, is the way to heaven. He is the only way back to God. His entire life on earth has been leading up to this one moment in time, this one event, to give his life. And he's explained it over and over again to his disciples. We really shouldn't be too critical of them, though. How many times did we hear the message of salvation before God opened up our eyes to the truth? We're like the disciples. We are slow to understand. In fact, Luke 18, 34, it says this, They did not understand any of these things. said they did not comprehend the things that were said. They just didn't get it. So Jesus begins his journey to Jerusalem for the last time. He's been ministering up in the area of Jericho, city of Jericho, a city that was called the City of Palms, a city that was located 15 to 20 miles northeast of the city of Jerusalem. There are actually two Jerichos, the ruins, the city that God destroyed through Joshua and his army, and the inhabited city, the city that was built by Herod the Great, uh, built as a winter palace, an oasis in the desert, a winter resort, a spa retreat. Matthew chapter 20, verse 29 says, They were going out from Jericho, and a great multitude followed him. There were crowds of people behind Jesus. They were all traveling on the same road. They were all heading on the road that leads from Jericho to Jerusalem. Heading to Jerusalem. It was time for the Passover feast. They were on their way to offer an animal sacrifice in the temple. Time to celebrate their deliverance. A time to remember that God had delivered them from the hand of the Egyptians. He had freed them from their bondage in Egypt. You know, it's estimated that over 260,000 lambs would be slaughtered at that Passover feast. Gallons of blood would pour off the altar. But think of this. The people who were walking with Jesus on that road, they didn't know that they were walking behind the true Passover lamb. They didn't know they were walking behind the one who was about to give himself as a sacrifice for them to pay for their sins, to remove them from their bondage, not from the Egyptians, but from their sin. They had no idea that God the Son was walking on the road with them. Matthew chapter 20, verse 30, it says... And behold, two blind men were sitting by the road. Matthew says, behold. It's a powerful word. It means, look, pay attention. I'm about to tell you something very important. Two blind men? You know, there were hundreds of blind men. There were hundreds of blind women. There were hundreds of blind children there. Many people had eye problems in that part of the world at that time. There, uh, there were eye infections from disease that, that had no cure. They didn't have prescriptions. They didn't have medical procedures. They didn't have eye surgery available. So the result was infections, and those infections led to blindness. Most of those who were blind just couldn't work. Their families couldn't support them. There was no government assistance. So they became beggars. And they would stand by the gates of the city and they would ask for financial help from the people going in and out of town. Jericho was known for its blind people. Why? Because they had a special balsam bush that was used to help treat eye infections. 
So there would be hundreds of blind people waiting and standing and sitting by the gates of the city. But Matthew calls our attention to two of them. He says, these two blind men, verse 30, hearing that Jesus was passing by, cried out, Krazo in Greek. They screamed. They yelled at the top of their lungs like they were, like they were crazy. They didn't care who heard them. They didn't care about anything except to get the attention of Jesus. It might be their only chance, their last opportunity to get help from him. What is amazing about these two blind men is that even though they were physically blind, they had spiritual insight. They had more than the people walking on the road behind Jesus. Maybe even had more than the disciples. Verse 30, it says that they cried out, Lord, Master, have mercy on us. Have mercy. We don't deserve your attention. We don't deserve your favor. We don't deserve your help. We know who we are. We know we are sinners. But we cry out to you. You are, look at what they say, you are the son of David. A word, a phrase that was used to describe the Messiah. The anointed one. The Christ in Greek. And they cried out, Lord, save us, help us. You are the one who has been sent from God. They knew more than most people know today. Remember when the angel Gabriel came to Mary, came to a village in Nazareth to a virgin named Mary, and he told her that through the power of the Holy Spirit, she would conceive a child. And that child would be in the royal line of David the king, and therefore would be called the son of David. A name for the Messiah, a name found in the Psalms. Psalm 89, Psalm 132, 2 Samuel 7. Everybody knew that the son of David meant the Messiah. Where did these two blind beggars get this information? How did they have such spiritual insight? How did they know who Jesus was? They got it. Where all true spiritual insight comes from. They got it from God. Remember when Peter declared that Jesus was the Christ? Remember that? Matthew 16, 17, how did Jesus answer him? He said, flesh and blood hasn't revealed this to you. But my Father, who is in heaven, these two blind beggars who had no physical sight, had spiritual insight from God. Verse 31, the multitude... The crowd, what did they say? Be quiet. The crowd always wants us to be quiet. But sometimes we just can't be quiet. They couldn't be quiet. These two men cried out, it says, all the more. They refused to be silenced. And they cried out again, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. Did Jesus rebuke them? Did he tell them to stop calling him by that name? Did he tell them not to reveal who he was to the people? He did that in the past, didn't he? When people would say who he was, he told them, keep it quiet. It wasn't time. He doesn't do that now. He doesn't do that. Instead, he stops, it says. He stops and he calls to them and he says, what is it you want me to do for you? Specifically, What is it that you want? I don't know what they were thinking. They said, well, Lord, we want to be able to see. We want our eyes opened. I think there might be a lesson in there for us. We need to be specific. Do we want our eyes opened? We need to ask the Lord to open our eyes. 
We need to cry out to Him. If we're living in disobedience, we need to ask Him to help us to be obedient. We need to be specific when we pray. Jesus made them be specific. You know, these men believed that the Lord could help them. And not only that, they believed that the Lord would help them. They had faith in Him, in what He could do. Matthew ends this account in verse 34 where it says, Jesus was moved with compassion. He was affected by their hopeless condition. In his mind, in his heart, he was gripped with tenderness, with pity. He cared about these two blind men by the side of the road. He's on his way to give his life for the world. I guess he probably had that on his mind, but he stops. And he stops for these two blind men. It says he touched their eyes, and immediately they received their sight. That's what he does. He touches us, and we receive sight. We don't want to do the things that we used to do. We want to be obedient. These two men received their sight, and Matthew says they followed him. That is what somebody does who's been touched by Jesus Christ. They want to follow him. Did they become disciples? That's a good question. I believe at least one of them did. Mark 10.46, John Mark, who wrote that account, the Gospel of Mark, identifies one of those men by the name of Bartimaeus. Well, how did Mark know that? He wasn't there that day. Well, Mark got a lot of his information from the Apostle Peter, who was there that day. But, you know, Mark didn't write down this account, his account, until 20 to 30 years later after it took place. This was just a blind beggar by the side of the road. Jesus healed thousands of them. But 30 years later, they knew this man by name. He just wasn't a blind beggar anymore. He was a follower of Christ He changes everything. Christ changes everything in our lives. We're no longer beggars, blind beggars. We are children of the King, disciples of Him. We're not the same people. Bartimaeus is not the same. It's a great story, isn't it? It's a great testimony of what Jesus Christ can do of his love, his compassion, how he changes the lives of people, normal people, people in need of help. That's what he does. But I still wonder, why did Matthew tell us to pay particular attention to this event? Why? Well, I think one of the reasons is that because this event... I believe, marks the beginning of the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. Wouldn't arrive there for several weeks. It was 15 miles away. But I think that was the start of the journey. Why? Matthew says, pay attention. He says, pay attention to this. Pay attention to not only what happened. He said, pay attention to the words that these two men used. They are announcing the coming of the king, the Messiah. They're telling the world that the king is here and he is on the road to Jerusalem. The Messiah, the son of David, is about to enter his city. Matthew 21, verse 1 says they approached Jerusalem. Several weeks later, they are several miles away from the city. John 12, 1 says that they were near a village called Bethany. It was a town where Jesus had raised his friend Lazarus from the dead three months before. It is now six days before the Passover. And Jesus will eat with Lazarus and with Martha and Mary, the sisters of Lazarus. He'll eat with them maybe for the last time before his crucifixion. Martha was serving the meal. 
Lazarus was reclining at the table with Jesus. And then John 12, 3 says that Mary took a pound of very costly, genuine spike nerd. She anointed the feet of Jesus. And it says she wiped his feet with her hair. A pound. She took a pound, 12 ounces, by Roman measure, of expensive perfume, nard, an oil that was taken from the root and the spike of a plant that was imported from India, from the hills, the mountains of India. It was expensive. We're told in John 12, 5, that it cost 11 months' wages for a laborer. That is some expensive perfume. And then, we're told, Mary let down her hair and she wiped the feet of Jesus. For a respectable Jewish woman, to let down her hair in public was considered shameful. It was more than that. It was considered immoral. To wash the feet of another person? That was considered degrading. That was only to be done by a slave, and even then, the lowliest of the slaves. She didn't care about financial loss. She didn't care about shame. She didn't care about any of that. Like the two blind men by the side of the road in Jericho, she did not care about anyone or anything except Jesus. That is all she cared about. This was perhaps her last opportunity, the last time she could express her love and her devotion to him. What was in her heart, the last time. And so she worshipped. She worshipped him. She worshipped at his feet. He's about to leave. He was about to leave this earth. John 12, 7, Jesus said to her, and to those who were watching, she did this to prepare for my burial. The road to Jerusalem would not be a road to his earthly kingdom. It would be a road that would lead to the cross, and it would be a road that would lead to his death. So John 12, 12 says, On the next day, he left his friends in Bethany. And then we're told, back in Matthew 21, verse 1, that he came to the small village of Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, a village that wasn't too far from Bethany. A village that was located near the road that was leading to Jerusalem. And there, we're told, John 12, 12 and 13 says that the people had heard that he was on the way. People who were already in Jerusalem, they heard he was coming and they came out to meet him. And they grabbed palm branches. They wanted to welcome him as their king. And he would enter Jerusalem as a king. But not the way that they thought that the Messiah would come. Matthew 21, verses 1 and 2, it says, Then he sent two of his disciples, and he said to them, Go to the village opposite you, nearby, and immediately you will find a donkey and a colt. Female donkey and her offspring. He says, untie them and bring them to me. The colt would follow its mother. And so both animals were to be brought to Jesus. Mark 11.2 says that no one had ever ridden on that colt before. It was considered an honor to ride on an animal that no one had ever ridden on. It was a special place of blessing. And Jesus would take that place of honor when he rode that colt into Jerusalem. Jesus tells these two unnamed disciples, verse 3, if anyone says something to you, you shall say the Lord has need of them and immediately he will send them. That would be like walking up into somebody's driveway and seeing the keys in their car and opening up the car door and you're about to get in the car and drive away. I think somebody's going to wonder what you were doing and why you were doing it. It's interesting. Some people have thought that all of this was arranged ahead of time. 
They thought that once the disciples gave the, the password, the secret word, that the owners of these animals would turn them over to the disciples. With all due respect to those who believe this, Jesus was always in control of his life while he was here on earth. Remember in John 10, 17 and 18, in speaking of his own death, he said, I lay down my life that I might take it up again. No one has taken it from me, he said. I lay it down on my own initiative. He said, I have the authority to lay it down and I have the authority to take it up again. Jesus Christ was always in control of the situation. And I think he certainly would know that these two animals would be in that place at that time, in that village, and he would know what the disciples needed to say in response to those who own the animals. He's God. Once again, the disciples were not aware of what was going on. They didn't know what was happening. They didn't know that what was happening was in fulfillment of an Old Testament prophecy. A prophecy that dealt with the arrival of the Messiah. John 12, 16. John's honest with us. I like this. He says, we didn't really know what was going on until after Jesus was glorified. Thank you, John. Matthew says in verse 4 that all of this took place that what was spoken through the prophet might be fulfilled. That is true. Actually, he quotes two prophets at this point. He quotes Isaiah 62, 11, Zechariah 9, 9. He says, verse 4, verse 5, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming, gentle and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. Mount Zion is the highest mountain in Jerusalem. The prophecy is for the people of Jerusalem. It is for the nation of Israel. 500 years before Jesus rode that colt into Jerusalem, Zechariah said, listen, here is how you will recognize your king. Here's how you will know your Messiah. He's not going to come on a horse. He's not going to come in a chariot as a conqueror, as a general. But he's going to come as a man of peace. He's not going to come to overthrow your oppressors and restore the nation of Israel by some violent revolution. He says, no, instead he's going to come with the quiet strength and confidence of meekness and gentleness. But the people, even the leaders of the people, didn't know their own scriptures. Problem that we might have today as well. Revelation 19 says that someday Jesus Christ will come on a white horse. His robe will be stained with the blood of his enemies. He will come as a conqueror. He will come to execute judgment as king of kings and lord of lords. But here, in Matthew 21, verse 5, he comes to make peace with God. He comes as a ransom to buy us back. He comes to take the punishment we deserve. And so he comes in humility, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Verse 6 says the disciples did as Jesus directed them, and they brought the donkey and the colt. Matthew 7, they then laid their garments on these animals on which he sat. Luke 19.35 clarifies that for us says that he sat on the smaller of the two animals. He didn't sit on both animals. He sat on the colt. And he began his descent from the Mount of Olives on the road that led to Jerusalem. They're less than a mile away from the city. 
There would be over two million people in the city on that day because of the Passover feast. There would be crowds everywhere. And so the procession for the king begins, verse 8. It said, most of the multitude spread their garments on the road, took off their coats, they took off their cloaks, they laid them down on the road as a carpet for Jesus to ride over. Why did they do that? Second Kings 9.13, we are told that the people honored their king Jehu by taking their clothes and laying them on the bare steps so the king could walk on the steps and over their clothes. It was a sign of submission and respect for their king. And it says in verse 8, they were cutting branches down. They were cutting them down from the trees and they were spreading them on the road. Branches from a palm tree. John 12, 13 tells us it was a a palm, a date palm. In the Bible, the palm tree is symbolic. Symbolic of prosperity. Symbolic of beauty. Of joy. And of salvation. The people spread the palms on the road welcoming him as their Messiah, as their king, as their means of provision and security, as their salvation. At least they have that part right. And it said there, verse 9, multitudes were going before him, and there was a multitude behind him. There were people all over. There could have been hundreds of thousands of people at this point as they were making their way into the city. And then, with what Matthew describes as a cry, Luke 19 describes as a loud voice, like one voice. It said they were all crying out. They were shouting. Krazo in Greek. Does that sound familiar? That's what the two blind beggars did. They cried out. Krazo, they screamed, and they shouted out together, Hosanna. What were they saying? Well, the word Hosanna is a Hebrew word. In fact, it's a Hebrew word that has been transliterated into English. In other words, the English and the Hebrew word are the same. But what does it mean? What, how does it translate? It means save us. It means save us now. It means give us salvation. And what do they call Jesus then in verse 9? Son of David. Messiah. Just like those two blind beggars. Blessed, they say in verse 9, you are the blessed one. No one could do the things that you do unless you have been blessed by heaven. They said, you are the one. You, they say in verse 9, are the one who comes in the name of the Lord with the power and with the authority of God Almighty. They just quoted Psalm 118, verse 26. A verse that everybody knew had to do with the Messiah. They're saying no one No one can stand before you. You're the Messiah. You're the King. You've healed the sick. You've raised the dead. Verse 9, Hosanna in the highest. Fulfill your divine purpose. That's what they're saying. Fulfill the reason that you have come. You're the Messiah. We've come to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. We've come to celebrate God's deliverance from the hand of Pharaoh. As Moses delivered the people of Israel from him, you deliver us from the Romans. And if you will do that, we will offer you praise all the way up to the throne of heaven. That's what they're saying. People didn't know that he hadn't come to conquer the Romans. He had come to conquer sin and death and the grave and hell and Satan. They didn't know he hadn't come to wage war. 
He had come to make peace with God for us. Just like the disciples. They didn't get it. Then, verse 10 says, he entered Jerusalem. And all the city was stirred. They were seo in Greek. They were shaken up, agitated, like being caught in an earthquake. And they were saying, who is this? What's this all about? Verse 11, the multitude said, this, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Well, they may have recognized who he was, but they didn't recognize why he had come. And it would only be a few days later that they would come to realize that he had not come to free them from their oppressors. It was the same crowd who shouted to him, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord who would stand before Pilate screaming, Crucify him. Same crowd. And Jesus would stand there, just like the prophet Isaiah had said he would, 700 years before Jesus came to earth. He said he would be despised. He would be forsaken and rejected by men. He would be a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. His appearance would be marred more than any other man. His back would be ripped open down to muscle and bone. His head would be crowned with two-inch swords piercing his skull. All of that would happen. In less than a week, those same people who were waving palm branches and declaring him to be their king would stand before Pilate. And when Pilate said, Behold your king, they would say again, Crucify him. And when he says, Shall I crucify your king? And the chief priests will say, We have no king but Caesar. Psalm 118 verse 27 says, Bind the festival sacrifice to the horns of the altar. And so John 19:16, Pilate, we are told, delivered him up to be crucified. Hmm. You know, sometimes we're like the disciples. We're sincere. But we're slow to learn. We're slow to understand. We're slow to see the things of God. Sometimes we just don't get it. Sometimes we're like that crowd along the road. We want what Jesus can give us. We want to be blessed by him. We only want him on our terms. Sometimes we're like Mary. And we worship at the feet of our Savior. And the only blessing that we want is to worship him. Or maybe you're like one of those blind beggars. You know you're blind. You know you need Christ. You know you need to cry out to him. Cry out to him just like they did. And you will be saved. Or maybe you're like those people in Jerusalem. You're full of questions. You're all shaken up. You're confused. You just don't know the answers, but you want to know, who is this Jesus? He will reveal himself to you. If you seek him with all your heart, he promises he will. We all fit in somewhere in that picture. Only you know where you stand with God. For those of us who know Christ, please remember this. As we celebrate the Lord's Supper together, As we remember him, please remember, we were all in that crowd that day. We all screamed out to Pilate, crucify him. That was all of us. Yes, that was all of us. Romans 5.10 says we were enemies of God. Colossians 1.20 says now we have peace with God through the blood of his cross and that is the message of Palm Sunday the king is here the king has come and he has come to buy back his enemies with his blood and his enemy that was you and that was me today 
we can lift up those palm branches and we can shout out, Hosanna! He has saved us. Hosanna to the son of David. He has saved us by his blood. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. That is the message of Palm Sunday. You've been listening to Bruce David Bell, pastor of Borean Bible Fellowship. If the Lord has ministered to you through this message and you would like more information, then visit us on the web at bbfva.org.